Good morning. Good morning again, everyone. We're so glad that you're here today. As they continue taking up the offering today, just want to remind you, if you did not get a bulletin when you came in, if you would, just uh, raise your hand in just a moment. Ushers will be passing by with extra bulletins, and uh, they'll be glad to get you one. I want to remind you of a few things. We had to make some changes due to weather and some other circumstances. We moved our trunk or treat uh, to tonight. It'll be tonight from 6.30 to 8.30. I hope that you could come out tonight and join the fun. It's going to be a great time of outreach and connecting with the community. Uh, if you could come and have a trunk, it's not too late to do that. Since we had to move it, you could still, if you could make, be here tonight and do a trunk, that would be great. Uh, we could always use more candy donated to help give out. So if you've got any more candy or treats that you could donate for that, it should be on sale now if you want to run out. <laughs> And get some, that would be great uh, to help us out tonight. We would appreciate all the help we could get for that. Don't forget also, we are collecting food now for our Thanksgiving giveaway. Uh, you've got information on that in the bulletin and on our website. Uh, you can uh, start bringing that food now. We're collecting it to give out the Saturday before Thanksgiving will be that giveaway. And we're also going to be purchasing the turkeys in bulk. We'll be buying those turkeys very soon. If you would like to, to contribute money to purchase the turkeys, just give a check or cash at the information counter there. You can make out the check to Lakeshore Christian Church and then uh, put on there for turkeys. And uh, we'll make sure it goes to that. We'll be glad uh, to have as many of you as possible help out with purchasing those turkeys to be given away. We're going to be doing this through the uh, branch, the uh, food pantry that we helped start, along with some other churches in the area. So we'd love uh, for you to help us out with that outreach effort as well. Last week, we had a Compassion Sunday, and I'm happy to announce that in addition to all the families that were already sponsoring Compassion Children here at Lakeshore, we had over 50-something more families uh, take children to sponsor uh, through Compassion. We're very excited about that. We also have some more uh, children available. The packets are out there again today. So if you weren't prepared last week or just wanted to pray about it and think about it, you can stop by the tables today after the service and look over those packets and see if God might be able to use you to make a difference in a child's life by sponsoring a child through Compassion International. I have another fun announcement. This is exciting. I'm so glad the way God has blessed this church family, uh, continuing to reach new people all the time. And we want to do everything we can to continue to facilitate the growth of the kingdom here. Starting the first Sunday in January, I believe that's January 5th, we're going to be starting with three services that Sunday. So the service times are going to change. So you might want to make a note of this. We'll be advertising it a lot between now and then. It doesn't start till that first Sunday in January, so don't make changes yet. But the first Sunday in January, the first service will be at 8.30. All right, you've been used to coming at 9. If you want that first service, it's going to be a little earlier now. Start at 8.30. The second service is going to be at 10 o'clock. And then the third service for you sleepyheads will be at 11.30 that day, all right? Three services right in a row, back to back. And that will, of course, allow us more room to grow, not only with seating in the auditorium, but also parking in the parking lot will be more accessible then for growth, uh, more available for growth at that point. Uh, be praying for all of our staff that will put extra uh, time and effort and energy on the staff that's staffing everything on Sundays. So we want your prayers for that. And we would love to have... More volunteers now. It's going to take more people to pull off three services on Sunday. More volunteers working with the programs here and with the praise team and with the sound and lights and video and all of that. So if you are interested in volunteering, volunteering if you're not already working in an area uh, like that and you would like to volunteer to help, please stop by the information counter. Leave us your information there. Maybe a note about what area you're interested in working in, and we'll have someone follow up with you on that. We can use all the help we can get as we take that step beginning January the 5th, I believe it is. As we prepare now for our message time, I want to especially ask you to lift up a dear sister in our church family, Denise Trice, who is back in the hospital. Denise has been going through a very extended battle with cancer, and it has been amazing to watch her and see her witness and her testimony through all of this. She has blessed so many people. Well, it's at a critical stage once again with her. Uh, they, uh, a while back, uh, a week or so ago, did a stent in her liver to try to correct some problems there. It did not work. They went in this past week and tried to do the stent again. And the report this morning is that one seems to be failing as well. Uh, it's a very critical time for her. So please, she has been such a warrior for Christ. 
throughout all of this. Please lift her up and her family up in your prayers, her husband, her son, uh, as they battle through this time that's very critical right now. I know there are many other prayer needs in the church family. Let's go to God in prayer together. Father, we come before you today thanking you for the honor and privilege of being able to wear the name of Christ. We know it's only because of what you've done, the work that you accomplished on the cross, that we could be adopted into your family and be your children. And Father, we especially want to lift up our dear sister Denise and her family. We thank you, Father, for the the powerful witness and testimony that she has been showing through all of this. And I know she doesn't feel like it right now, but she is a mighty warrior for you. And Father, we just pray that in your grace, in your mercy, you would be with her in a way that is so special that she can feel it more than ever. She can sense your presence and your power and your provision for her. Be with her husband, with her son, Father. Give them strength and comfort that only you can give. Father, we selfishly, we want a miracle to occur where she could stay with us for so, so much longer. And Father, if that's within your will, we pray that you would work that miracle in her life. But Father, whatever your will is, what a blessing she is. We thank you for her and her witness. We lift up to you the other needs in our church family. We thank you that you will hear and answer our prayers in a way that's best according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're new to us here at Lakeshore today, we are in a study together churchwide called The Story. There is a book by that name. It's available there uh, if you stop by the information counter. If you'd like to get one of those books, it's $10 for the hard copy book there. We got a really good deal on those. You might want to get some as gifts for other people. Stop by there today and let them know if you need any books. Uh, we are in what chapter this week? 14. How many of you read chapter 14? Raise your hand. I love it. I had a guy come in this morning, said I got up extra early this morning, had an extra hour, and I read chapter 14 so I could raise my hand. <laughs> when Preacher Andy asked, I could put my hand up too. Paul Smith, not calling any names, but uh, <laughs> so glad that you're able to do that this morning. So uh, I, I do want you to be reading along, even if you're not right up with us on the chapter and everything, just be reading. It's, it's wonderful the way they put the scriptures in chronological order so that you could follow along in the history of time chronologically, see how the upper story of God has been at work throughout history and how he has worked in the lower story through individual lives that we've been looking at in each lesson each week. And I want you to know, I want you to see, I want it to be real to you that God is still writing the story and you are here as a part of it and God has a plan and a purpose for your life and your lower story matters in the upper story. And I want you to make that connection that your life is vitally important to what God wants to do in the world today and he can use you. Well, last week we looked at the life of Solomon. And during the time that Solomon was king, as we saw last week, he, he did a lot of good things, but he also got off track, didn't he? We, we looked at the little black box. We had the record of Solomon's life, and we could, we could look back and get the data and see that, that Solomon made some decisions, especially when it came to marriage, that were outside of God's will. But there were other decisions once he got outside of God's will. There were many, many other decisions then that, that were made in a bad way that negatively affected the kingdom and God's people. His disobedience brought a response from God. I want you to catch this connection too. In every story we've looked at, in every lower story where the individuals involved disobeyed God, God always responded to the disobedience. All right, he responds to the obedience. We've seen that too. But he also has a response for the disobedience. We think sometimes we're getting by with it. We think maybe God hasn't held us accountable. Maybe there's no consequences to what we've done. But there's always a response from God when there's disobedience. And the response from God for Solomon's disobedience ended up being that the kingdom, remember this kingdom that he had promised he was going to build through Abraham and his descendants, this kingdom is torn in two. It is split into two parts. The very kingdom that was supposed to display God's glory and God's presence on the earth is now anything but a display of the power and the glory of God because it was split in two. Now, this division of the kingdom, the word division, I think is a good word to describe our culture today. 
And our culture today, that's the good thing about these stories. They so much apply to our lives today and our culture today. Our culture today, one of the identifying marks of our culture today is division. Isn't it? Think about our culture right now. There is division among the nations. Look at all the fighting going on out there. The, the, the conflict that's happening between nations right now. There's political division in our own country, right? There's, there's almost like this bitterness and hatred between two political parties in our country. There is division in business. There is division uh, in recreation and in sports. My house was divided yesterday. <laughs> Not really divided, but Georgia-Florida game. My wife is, bless her heart, a Gator fan. <laughs> we certainly want to extend mercy to. <laughs> There's this division that takes place. There's also division in our homes, is it there? So many marriages, so many homes breaking apart, being torn apart by bad decisions being made. But God's will for us is that we live in unity, in harmony, in peace, to live without alienation, without dissension and division. He wants us to foster unity whenever and wherever it's possible. The scripture is clear on this. In Psalm 133 and verse 1, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's God's will. That's what God wants for his people, that we dwell together in unity. In Romans 12 and verse 18, he says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, you can't control everybody else, but who can you control? Yourself. You can decide to be an agent of unity or an agent of division. It's up to you to make that choice how you're going to live your life. And God's will is that we be promoting unity. Well, during the time it really started with David and on into the reign of Solomon, the nation of Israel was at its zenith. It was at the height of glory. It was blessed in every possible way. Things were really kicking along. It was really good. For them, if they were to be talking about it later on, they would have said, those were the glory days, right? Those were the glory days for our kingdom, the reign of David, the reign of Solomon. That was the height of the glory in this new nation that God had formed to bring people to him, to show people his works and his blessings, his provisions. They were certainly good evidence of that early on. But then, shortly after that, remember as Solomon began to mess up, things began to spiral downward for this kingdom that God had established. You see, they only could control themselves, but they made choices themselves to get away from God, from God's will, from God's clear instruction. And they were making decisions outside of the will of God. After Solomon dies, the nation of Israel is divided. There were ten tribes in the north that aligned themselves under a man by the name of Jeroboam. That became known as Israel. That part of the kingdom was known as Israel. That part of the division. Then there were the tribes of the south, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin down in the south. They were loyal to their leader, Rehoboam who was the son of Solomon, and the southern kingdom began known, to be known as Judah. So here you have what was supposed to be a united kingdom, showing God's glory, God's power, God's provision. Now it's torn in two. You've got two separate kingdoms. Not only are they divided geographically, they are divided in so many other ways too. They are fighting against each other. Now all of them are God's people. All of them were supposed to be part of the one nation that God was establishing. And here, because of their disobedience, because of the work I am certain of the deceiver, they have convinced themselves, let's do it the way we want. This is our preference. We're going to follow what we want. And because of that, God's people were divided. And when they were divided, they ceased to represent God in the world as God had wanted them to represent him. They were not fulfilling their purpose any longer because of this division and this infighting between all the people who were supposed to be in the same family, in the same kingdom, worshiping the same God. 
Well, it all transpires, we can see it in 1 Kings. Back in 1 Kings chapter 11, God had picked Jeroboam to be the next king when Solomon died. But Solomon had a problem with that because Jeroboam was not his son. He was on staff with Solomon, but he wasn't his son. Solomon wanted one of his sons to be king. And so already Solomon has a problem with what God had wanted to do. So Solomon responds, he gotten so far away from God by trying to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam has to flee to Egypt until Solomon passes away. In 1 Kings eleven forty three, it says this, Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Now you see the problem we got here? We have two kings. We have the one who God appointed and said, That's the one I want to be king. And we've got the one man appointed. Solomon decided on his own. I want my son Rehoboam to be king. Whew, no kingdom can survive with two heads. It doesn't work. The scripture is clear that that causes nothing but trouble. Our friend Barry Cameron said this, anything with two heads belongs in a sideshow. <laughs> I think that's true. A kingdom with two heads will not last long. We're going to learn some important lessons from this story today. And it's recorded for us all through Scripture. We have so many things we could focus on. But I want to focus on three important lessons for us to gather from this chapter in the story. The first thing, number one, is this. Past conduct can create division. It can also create good things. It can create unity. But when past conduct is not what it ought to have been, it can create division, problems, conflict, dissension with past decisions that were made that were not what they should have been. It will do one or the other. The past will either bring division or it will bring unity in the future. So the kingdom of Israel was split. But why? What was it that happened in the past? Well, this massive division coming to a whole nation, you could trace it back to the failures of one man, Solomon. Because he was the king and because he strayed from God and God's leading and God's direction... Because he allowed his heart to be turned away from God by those wives who wanted him to worship foreign gods, other gods, he allowed himself to be swayed by that. And because of that, his wisdom, his decision making went downhill fast. And he began to make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. And it led to the downfall of the nation. You can be sure when the leaders of any people have their hearts turned from God, the truth of God, and they make decisions outside of that truth and that will, the whole nation will suffer bad consequences. God will respond to that disobedience, and he will bring punishment and discipline to that nation. That's the way God responds to disobedience. So division comes to the entire nation, and the reason for it is really Solomon. Not only did he turn his heart away from the one true God and start worshiping false gods, he also, because of that, was making decisions outside of the will of God in a lot of other ways. Remember, he became very wealthy, and he started taking on, we saw last week, large building projects and, and acquisition of more land and more possessions for himself, more houses for himself, all of those things. Well, guess how he was paying for a lot of that? On the backs of the people that he was supposed to be ruling. He started taxing them higher and higher and higher taxes. Does any of this ring familiar? <laughs> In order to have all the stuff they wanted to have and do all the stuff they wanted to do, the only way to do that is to take more from the people so you can do all of that. The problem with that is sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And they are so burdened by it, they can't, they can't have any joy in life anymore. They can't have contentment. They, they are being oppressed by how great the taxes are. And that was beginning to happen to the people under Solomon's rule. Well, we know that because of all of this disobedience in, uh, from Solomon, God had made a decision to respond to that. In 1 Kings 11, beginning with verse 9, we read about that response. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, here's what he said is going to happen. 
Since this is your attitude, you've not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you. I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Wow, what a lesson. Sometimes we only think of decisions of leaders that have great consequence. We think they're the only ones who have decisions that have great consequence. But I want you to understand that all of us make decisions. We have made decisions leading up today in our lives that have affected the future already. We've all made decisions already that have already been so aligned that they will affect the future one way or another. And good decisions based on God's teaching will bring blessings in the future. But you can be sure when we decide contrary to God's way and God's will, those decisions will also affect the future. And they will affect the future in a negative way. Now think about your own life. Our present decisions that you're making right now are going to make a difference in what the future looks like for you, for your family, for your descendants. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? For those that are coming behind you. Because the decisions you're making now are creating that legacy. They are creating the legacy that you're going to leave behind. That's going to impact the future for your family. For this church. If you're going to be part of this church. For this community. If you live in this community. Your decisions have an impact on what the future is going to look like. I could think back in my own life. I could see so many key critical moments where decisions were made. One was one of the best that was ever made for me. It was back in the summer of 1975. A guy by the name of Gene McGee had made the decision to be the preacher at Elberton Christian Church. He was, at the time he made that decision, living in St. Augustine, Florida. He moved, he and his wife Lois and their daughter Sue Ann to Elberton, Georgia. And he came there to be our preacher at my home church. And he started there as the preacher in the summer of 1975. That's the summer that changed my life so dramatically. It's the summer I met my wife. It's the summer that I got to know this family. That that relationship began. That ended up leading me into ministry. To be a preacher. It's the summer that that had different decisions been made, I don't know how it would have affected me, but I know it wouldn't have been like it is now. I know it would not have ended up the way it is now had those decisions not been made. And by the way, it's a long story how he ended up going from St. Augustine, Florida to Elberton, Georgia. There's a whole lot that had to happen for that to take place. Well, I can look back and think of other key moments of decisions. For this church, I met with a group of leaders here in November 1990. November of 1990. My brother had been stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky in the Army. Uh, He was deployed, and we were coming up on Thanksgiving to visit with his family. And this leaders at this congregation at Lakeshore Christian Church had contacted me through another church that gave them my name. They said they'd like to meet with me. I said, well, I'm going to be in the area just by chance. I'm going to be in the area around Thanksgiving. I'll be glad to swing by and say hello to you and talk to you about the situation there. Well, after that meeting is when they decided, and Sue Ann and I decided, to come serve as the preacher at this church. And that changed my life dramatically in a huge way. I think for the better. Most days. (laughs) No, always, much better. And I'm so grateful for that. Well, I can think of others in the life of this church. In March of 2009, we celebrated our first service in this building when we located, relocated from another campus to this campus. That decision had been made almost two years before that by the leaders here, and we knew that we needed to do something to have more impact and reach more people for the kingdom. We had totally maxed out where we were, the property we were located on before. We couldn't grow much anymore there. We knew we needed to make a move, and 
this is after praying and searching and asking for God's direction, we made the decision to move to this campus and celebrated our first service here in March of 2009. You think that made a difference? Since that service, over 600 people in less in four, a little over four years, over 600 people have come to know Christ and be added to the church family here at this church location. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean there haven't been struggles or challenges. Of course there have. Even when you make right decisions, it doesn't mean there are not going to be challenges or problems. And we still need to reach more. And that's why we're making a decision to go to three services in January because there's still more lost people out there that we need to do whatever it takes to reach them with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful we've had a congregation that's been willing to go through those transitions and those changes and be supportive. Because here's what I know. Anytime a church makes major changes like that, major decisions like that, Satan would love to use those to create division, to tear the church body apart. He would love to have some individual so upset, so dissatisfied and, and angry and wanting their way and not getting their way. He would love to use somebody like that to just rip apart that part of the kingdom. Because when a kingdom is divided, it cannot represent the glory of God in the world. And it cannot be attractive to the lost and the dying who need to know Jesus Christ. There will be other decisions, I know, that will affect the future. If Jesus delays his coming, there will be decisions that have to be made, hard choices that have to be made as a church. And Satan always looks for those opportunities to use people to create division and dissension in the body of Christ. Just like he used Solomon and his foreign wives to rip that kingdom in two. I pray that you would understand how important your decisions are, not just from a church perspective, but from an individual perspective as well. I want you to understand that your decisions are what make your legacy. So if you can make better decisions starting today, some of you are thinking, well, I've already made so many bad ones. I've already messed up so much. Well, listen, God specializes in redeeming even our bad decisions, okay? And even bringing good out of those when we come to him in humble submission and repentance. He can even use those bad things to bring about some good lessons, some good changes, some, some things to open up doors of opportunity for the future to make a real impact. So understand that even if you've messed up some in the past, we all have. The leaders of this church have. I have personally. So have you. All of us have made some bad decisions along the way. But God is big enough. He's bigger than that. And he can redeem that and use that for some good. If you're willing to come to him and make that change and start making decisions under him and his authority instead of just doing what you want, what your preference is, you truly seek God's will, God's direction, God's teaching for how you make those decisions. So that leads me to the second thing we need to see here too. And that is, even when you're trying to do that, understand that bad counsel can create division too. If you get the wrong counsel from the wrong people, that can really mess things up too. And we see that clearly lived out in this story of uh, chapter 14 here with uh, those, these two that are now in position of being a king of that's divided, this divided kingdom, they were still making decisions now that were having an effect, and they were listening to some really bad counsel. Rehoboam, uh, in the southern section, sought the counsel of the elders about something. Some of the people came to him and said, uh, this is a great opportunity. By the way, Jeroboam led the group. You know, he's, he's already a divisive character there a little bit. But he led this group, and they came to Rehoboam and said, You know, your dad overtaxed us, and it's a real burden on the people. Would you consider, now that you're king, lightening the load a little bit? Would you consider changing this a little bit so that we could have some of the weight taken off of us? So Rehoboam goes to the elders there that had led his father to get counsel from them. Those elders said to him, it would be a good thing to listen and to lighten the load a little bit, to reduce some of the tax burden that your father put on these people. So he had some good advice there, right? The elders were saying, you know what, this is a good opportunity for you to do something that would be a good gesture for, to the people to maybe get them a little more unified again behind you and your leadership. 
But we find in 1 Kings 12, beginning with verse 8, that Rehoboam decided not just to go to them. He also went to some of his comrades of his own age, younger men, who had not been ruling at the time those decisions were made, who were now uh, part of his entourage. And because of their advice, he rejects it. He rejects the elders' counsel. Look at verse 8 and 9. Rehoboam rejected the advice that the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. In other words, his yes men, right? Who would tell him what he wanted to hear. He went to them for counsel, okay? He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? He followed their counsel. You know what their counsel was? Uh Uh-uh, this is not the time to let up. This is the time to pour it on. Put Put your foot to the pedal. Go even harder on these people. Put even more pressure on them. You gotta show them who's boss, Rehoboam. And he listened to the counsel of those younger advisors. And when he did that, immediately the northern tribes separated from the south. They weren't going to have any part of that. That's ultimately the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. The thing that sent them over the edge. Where they thought we can no longer be under his rule. We can't survive like this. And they split off into another kingdom. The nation was divided because he was listening to bad advice. But it wasn't just Rehoboam who got bad advice. Jeroboam got bad advice too, and he listened to it. He was up there in the northern kingdom, and he was worried. In 1 Kings 12, beginning with verse 26, it says, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of their Lord in Jerusalem. So he's worried. If they go back to Jerusalem for their worship and for the temple offerings and all that, they'll end up going back to to that kingdom. They won't stick with me. They won't support me if they do that, right? He's worried about himself and his position and his power, okay? So he's thinking, well, uh, uh, if they go back there, they'll give their allegiance to Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to him. In verse 28, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, like I'm doing this for you guys, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Wow. Boy, we have to make some decisions that are hard sometimes, don't we? And you like to get some counsel, don't you? But you know what I have found that a lot of people do? They pretty much already made up their mind what they want to do, and so they're looking for a counselor who will tell them what they want to hear. They come to me sometimes, Pastor Andy, and say, Pastor Andy, what do you think I ought to do here? And what they're hoping I will say is whatever they've already decided to do, right? That I will simply give a stamp of approval to what they've already decided to do. And if I don't do that, they'll sit in my office and shake their head. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, I understand, yes. And go right out and try to find somebody else to talk to (laughs) who will then tell them what they were wanting to hear to start with. I know what happens. It happens all the time. You know how I know? I see what you go ahead and do after I've given you counsel to do something else. I see it all the time. I've been guilty of that too. We all like to hear somebody we think is going to give us advice that we think is, is the right thing, that what we've already thought was the right thing anyway. That's what we want to hear. All of us are inclined toward that. So we have to remember, if we're going to get counsel to help make better decisions, it needs to be counsel from people who truly are God-honoring people and who truly put God's kingdom first above everything else. That's why I highly recommend, like you need marriage counseling or financial counseling, you need to get it from people who honor God and God's word and God's teaching in those areas, whatever area it is that you're getting counsel in. You need to get it from people who set up God's word as the authority for the counsel that they're going to give. Now, when I say Christian counseling, understand that a lot of people put Christian on their counseling offices who aren't giving you Christian counseling. You need to understand that and be able to discern that. If it's not in line with the Word of God, it's not Christian counseling. I don't care what name they put on it, okay? God's Word is the authority for Christian counseling, always. So if it's not in line with God's Word, you can know for sure this is not counseling from God. It's not Christian counseling at all. 
So if you truly want to make better decisions and leave a God-honoring legacy with your life, then you've got to seek counsel from the right sources, from godly sources to make better decisions. Well, the final lesson is this. When it comes to this lesson we learned from Rehoboam and Jeroboam and how they got the wrong, they listened to the wrong counsel, they went and got it, and they listened to it, they did the wrong things, it, their whole nation had to suffer for it. With the legacy you're writing will determine whether or not those that you influence will suffer or be blessed by it. So let's try to do a better job of it. And the third lesson is this. Commitment to Christ can create unity for the future. A real commitment to Christ, to his teaching, to his authority, can create unity. Now, I want to put a word of caution here. Jesus did warn us that for some people to come to Christ would not create unity but division. That's because they're going to have a spouse or a family member or a friend who does not come to Christ too. And that can create conflict and division. If you commit yourself to Christ, you want to serve Christ, but they don't, then that can create conflict. Okay? So Jesus is saying there can be conflict when you come to follow me. But here's what he also said. If, if you follow me and those that you love and care about and work with follow me too, then that's a source of unity for you in your life and for your family. A commitment to Christ, to his teachings, can be a great source of creating unity in your life. Jesus prays a beautiful prayer in the New Testament. In John chapter 17, it's recorded for us. I love this prayer. It is powerful. It says so much more than we grasp most of the time when we read it. The first part of this prayer, Jesus is praying for those disciples that are right there with him at the time. But then he changes the prayer in verse 20, and he includes a lot of other people in this prayer. He starts praying in verse 20 of John 17 for all those who would become his followers for all time. In other words, he's praying for who? For us. Jesus is praying for us. That's why this prayer, to me, is so powerful. He's praying specifically for us here in this room today as followers of Jesus Christ. So what does Jesus pray for us? Let's look. My prayer is not for them alone, not just those disciples that were there at the time. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be, what's that word? One, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us And here's the reason Jesus prays this. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why does he pray that his followers would be one? What's the purpose for that? So that the world might believe in Jesus. Wow. How important is the unity of Christians? How important is it that we not be divided? How important is it that we not create dissension? How important is it that we don't let Satan use us to rip apart the body of Christ? It's essential if we're going to reach the lost that we have unity in the body of Christ. We will not be able to do it without unity. He continues the prayer. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one As we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And he adds it again. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Have you ever, ever wondered why the church and our culture today is not more effective? It looks like sometimes, and the church in America, by the way, is losing ground, not gaining ground. Have you ever wondered why we're not more effective in reaching the lost and impacting our culture? I can give you a clue. It's right here in this prayer. Look at how we have divided the church of Jesus Christ into all these different denominations and groups that exist in the world today. Remember, I say this a lot here at Lakeshore. Given enough time and opportunity, what can we do? We can mess it up. We took what Jesus wanted for his church and totally messed it up. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus can redeem it. He didn't pray this prayer in vain. He can redeem it. But the only way he can redeem it is for all of us who are part of the church today to let Jesus rule instead of demanding what we want. That's the only way is to let Jesus rule Instead of demanding what we want. As our praise team gets ready, I want to read a few more verses to you 
to emphasize how important it is that we bring ourselves totally and completely under the Lordship of Jesus Christ for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ today. In Proverbs 6, beginning with verse 16, he writes this, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and here's something God hates, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. God hates that. Now, if you're letting Satan use you for that, God hates what you are allowing to happen in your life. 1 Corinthians 11 Paul's writing to that church there. They've got all kinds of problems. And one of the problems they had, he, he reveals to us in, in 11, beginning with verse 17. He says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. You ever been to a church meeting that did more harm than good? I have. Boy, that's no fun. Do you think we're going to bring people to Christ when we have meetings like that? Absolutely not. You know why he says they're doing more harm than good? In verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. You know how Satan can do more harm to the church than anything outside the church? By creating division within the church. He can do a lot more damage to the church from within than he has ever done from without. Just by allowing... Uh, people allowing him to use them to create dissension and division in the body of Christ. He can destroy the work of the church, the witness of the church and the community. And all you have to do is look at congregations, even right around Nashville here, that have divided and split over arguments, over things that were not essential things to start with. And yet the kingdom of God has been ripped apart by people who demanded their own way, that the leaders of the church, that everybody in the church catered to what they wanted, and not let Jesus be the Lord of the church. In Colossians 1, I want to close with this one, verse 18. It says, speaking of Christ, And He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. You really want to leave a legacy that honors God? It begins with making Christ supreme over your heart and your mind and the decisions that you make. Because when you make Christ supreme, you will be an agent of unity in the kingdom of God. You will bring people to Christ because they see the church unified, that you are part of the church unified. And that will draw people to Jesus the people who need him the most. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come and be a part of that here at Lake Shore.